This is Lake Panur. Let me tell you about this lake that vanished into thin air. It's the kind of story that makes you think you're being pranked, but that's not what I'm doing. It's a hard-hitting reality. This disaster happened in 1980. It really puts things into perspective. Just imagine a drilling accident causing an entire lake to disappear. It's almost hard to believe, but it really happened. And the crazy thing is, it wasn't even a massive mine, just a modest one. So if you want to know what really happened in Lake Penure, stick to the end of the video. With that said, let's start. Well, mines have always fascinated me. The idea is that humans can dig so deep into the earth to extract precious resources is mind-blowing. But let me tell you the scale of some of these operations. It is just incomprehensible. I can't even begin to imagine the sheer amount of engineering skill and effort that must have gone into constructing this mine. And yet, despite all of that, one simple mistake caused an entire lake to be drained. It just goes to show how fragile our environment can be and how even the smallest of errors can lead to massive consequences. This story is a reminder of the importance of caution and care in all our endeavors, whether big or small. It's also a testament to the resilience of nature as the local ecosystem adapted to the sudden influx of seawater. But most of all, it's a fascinating and cautionary tale that reminds us of the awesome power of nature and the fragility of our human endeavors. Let me tell you a fascinating story about the Jefferson Island mine inundation, also known as the Lake Penure disaster. It all started way back in 1894, when a famous actor named Joseph Jefferson decided to drill a well near his home in Louisiana. This man was no ordinary actor. He was an acquaintance of both actor John Wilkes Booth and the man he killed, President Abraham Lincoln. Can you imagine the history this man had witnessed? Anyway, Jefferson had purchased an island to live on, and the island was named after him. It was located 12 miles west of New Iberia, Iberia Parish, along the shore of the freshwater 1,300-acre Lake Penure. His contractors were digging for a new well and discovered something unexpected. They discovered rock salt at around 300 feet and they continued to drill down to a depth of about 2,000 feet, where they still encountered rock salt. It was frustrating, but this was actually a potentially profitable discovery. Salt is valuable, and it was known to exist around the lake. Here's where it gets even more interesting. The five islands in the area, including Jefferson's, were actually salt domes with a rock cap. They weren't really islands, just high spots of land. The discovery of salt led to the formation of the Jefferson Island Salt Company, which began extracting salt from beneath the lakes. The company operated for decades, and the mine grew to be one of the largest salt mines in the United States. But, as we know, things took a terrible turn in 1980, when a drilling accident caused most of the lake to just disappear, resulting in the Jefferson Island mine inundation. It's incredible to think that something as seemingly small as a drilling accident could cause such a massive disaster. It just goes to show the immense scale of even a modest mine like this one. It's truly a fascinating story that highlights the unpredictable nature of the earth and the risks that come with mining. Well, let's get back to the story. After Jefferson's death in 1905, the island's precious salt began to be mined for use below ground. Two guys dug several holes all across the island in July 1919 to chart the salt dome. The men who had explored the island, Jones and Bayless, established the Jefferson Island Salt Mining Corporation in October 1999. The business made a second attempt to dig a shaft in 1999 after the first one failed. The project was delayed by an additional two years due to water penetration problems. The pillar and chamber method of excavation was increasingly used throughout the next few years. This technique, which is widely used in the sector, entails grid pattern mining while leaving pillars behind to support the mine ceiling. The complex of tunnels originally consisted of an 800 foot deep level, but by the 1930s, annual production had increased to almost 200,000 tons of rock salt. 75 feet broad and 90 feet high made up the chambers. In 1940, a new level that was a thousand feet deep had inclined and added to the mine. On this level, a shrinkage approach was applied rather than chamber and pillar. The additional chambers on the 1,000 feet level were 100 feet high by 65 feet wide and lined up beneath the chambers of the 800 feet level, with the salt mines cut horizontally from bottom to top. The mine was sold to the Diamond Crystal Salt Mine Corporation in 1957 and, business as usual, resulted in higher production. 
In the early 1960s, the mine was expanded with a 1300 foot level and an air shaft, and a 1500 foot level was built in the 1970s. The mine's staff was about 290 people strong as the 1970s came to an end. The location was open every day of the week for three shifts of eight hours each. The Dow Canberra Canal and the Intercoastal Canal were used to move the harvested salt away from the lake by boat. Let me tell you about the other player in this story. You might have heard of them before. It's Texaco. They were busy exploiting the oil and gas reserves around Lake Panasofsky, while the Diamond Crystal Mining Company was digging for phosphate. But as you know, that's never enough for these big companies. Texaco wanted to expand its operations in the area during the 1980s, and that meant getting its drill out. Texaco got a license from the state that covered the entire Lake Panasofsky area. Can you believe that? They had the whole lake to themselves. To find new oil reserves, they needed to drill, and that's exactly what they did. But they didn't do the labor-intensive work themselves. They hired smaller local drilling outfits to do the dirty work, while Texaco handled the project oversight, well, planning and license acquisition. It's just mind-boggling to think about how much power these companies had back then. They could basically do whatever they wanted, and nobody could stop them. And all for what? To make a quick buck? It's frustrating to think about how the environment and local communities were affected by their actions, but I guess that's just the way it was back then. We can only hope that things have changed for the better now. Upon the issuance of its license, 124, in 1980, Texaco hired the new Iberia-based Wilson Drilling Corporation and Grafton Drilling Company to drill two exploratory wells with the designations P20 and number 35 respectively. P20 on the lake, around 2,100 feet from the mine's main shaft entrance, and number 35, approximately 1,200 feet southeast and 400 feet inland from the lake shore, were both near the crystal mine. Plans called for drilling both wells to identical depths of 8,000 feet. Let me break down the differences between these two wells for you. So we've got P20, which was situated right on the lake. That meant everything needed to be waterborne to support the drilling operation. On the other hand, number 35 was on land, making it much easier to supply via road with trucks. Now, let's focus on P20. The location for this well was surveyed and staked out way back in October 1979. The allowable maximum amount of relocation east or west was set to be 150 feet without any obstruction. The route to the proposed well along the lake bed was dredged and pilings were driven to form the base of the rig. Fast forward to June 1980, and the Wilson Drilling Corporation began installing their rig at the well site. This installation was called Number One. The crews scheduled to work on the new well would do a 12-hour shift, followed by 24 hours of rest period on land. Can you imagine working on a rig like that for 12 hours straight? It must have been exhausting. And that's not even half of it. There was a tool pusher who lived and worked on the rig for a four-day on-off rotor. Multiple crewmen manned the rig on their 12-hour shifts, forming 24 hours of constant drilling. It was a non-stop operation. All of this was overseen by a Wilson supervisor who was then overseen by a Texaco foreman who would do seven days on and seven days off. These two guys were the ones making all the most important decisions. The drilling of the well was getting underway, and by the 18th of November, everything was nearly ready to go. A 16-inch conductor pipe had been driven into the lake beds the day before drilling was set to begin. And then, finally, Day one of drilling began at 6 p.m. on the 18th of November and was supposed to run for 12 hours to 6 a.m. on the 19th. Things started off well, with the first shift drilling at a rate of 61 feet per hour for the first 10 and a half hours at a depth of just short of 500 feet. And to top it off, a survey was done and the work was found to be within one degree of being perfectly vertical. But as we all know, things don't always go according to plan. By the next shift, Booked at 1800 hours on the 19th of November, the hole was around 900 feet deep. Both mud pumps were working, and things seemed to be going pretty well until disaster struck. Pump number one's clutch burnt out. The drilling operations had to slow down. It must have been so frustrating to have to slow down when things were going so well, but that wasn't even the worst of it. At around 1090 feet, another survey was taken, and it was found to be 0.5 degrees off vertical. It's incredible to think that just half a degree could cause so much trouble, but when you're drilling a well, even the slightest deviation can have massive consequences. It's moments like these that really highlight how delicate and complex drilling operations can be. One small problem can lead to a massive setback. It's a reminder that we need to take care of our planet and its resources 
as extracting them can have a huge impact on the environment and the people involved in their production. The rig would run into another issue at 1,248 feet. The drill they were using was stuck. The Texaco drill foreman was alerted to the problem with the drill just before 5 in the morning. The crew attempted to raise, rotate and drop the drill, but nothing happened. The crew was instructed by the foreman to make the mud thicker. Drilling mud, as a side note, aids in drilling operations and aids in the removal of the drilled material from the hull. At this time, both pumps had started up once more and they pumped the heavier muck, which raised the pressure in the pit below. The indicator started to display a weight on the drill bit of more than 78,000 pounds, up to 240,000 pounds. The drill bit's wire was released, lowering its weight to a far more manageable 40,000 pounds. This sense of relief was fleeting, however, as the weight soon increased to almost 100,000 pounds. By 5.45, the new crew took over, and shortly after, a fairly unsettling sound emanated from the rig. The crew was greatly confused when the drill bit's weight increased to a staggering 400,000 pounds, or the equivalent of all the donuts I could possibly devour in one sitting. As the rig started to tilt, the perplexity would transform into concern. Wilson and Texaco were informed of the now odd circumstance. Both businesses decided to try to level the rig. It appears that the pilings slipping and creating an uneven surface are prevalent. The rig kept leaning, and it was clear that this was not usual. All team members were told to leave the platform by the foreman. In an effort to try and save the equipment on board, the crew pulled loose the barges that were moored to the rig. The drilling rig rolled over and started to sink at around 7.25 in the morning. Witnesses were astounded to see the rig entirely submerged beneath the water, which shouldn't have even been feasible considering the deepest point of the lake was about 12 feet. So where do you suppose it could have gone? I think you know very well. Miners at the Crystal Salt Mine were just starting their shift as the leaning rig was being taken down. They obviously were unaware of the calamity that was about to occur and thwart their plans for the day. There were 48 workers present, and before 8am they were dispersed around the mine's various levels. Worker Junius Gadsen was gathering electrical equipment at the 1300 foot level. Nobody in a mine wants to see a two foot high turret of water approaching them, but that's what he saw. Men were taken to the surface on the lift as the mine was evacuated after he sounded the alert. Wilfred Johnson, who was on the 1,500 foot level, climbed to the 1,300 foot level to look into the water, but he soon had to leave because of the mounting downpour. One of the four men used a pickup truck to pick up workers in the deeper, more extreme areas of the mine, and the evacuation went quite smoothly overall. Everyone was free by 9 o'clock in the morning. The fact that nobody inside the mine or on the drilling rig perished is a complete miracle. Even though nobody was missing, the entire lake was actively attempting to vanish. Nonetheless, a vortex, about a quarter of a mile wide, developed over the rig's rugged terrain. A tugboat, several barges and two Texaco oil rigs were all swept into the depths by it. Two lake users were unable to motor their boats to shore, demonstrating once more how lucky everyone was. The entire lake vanished into the mine during the following three hours. Typically, the lake, supplied by the Dao Canberra Canal, which then flowed to Vermilion Bay before reaching the Gulf of Mexico. However, the flow was reversed during the catastrophe, pulling water from the sea and filling back into the lake, and this continued for a number of days. All the air from the mine was forced out of the air shaft, which turned into a mud cannon and poured thick muddy water all around. Residents in the area were evacuated and personnel from the State Wildlife and Fisheries Department, Dale Canberra Police, Vermilion Parish Sheriff's Office, Louisiana State Police, Siberia Parish Sheriff's Office and the Vermilion Parish Sheriff's Office were called in to assist with the increasing number of people being displaced. Seven of the 11 ships that had disappeared under the maelstrom eventually surfaced as the water pressure eventually equalised. As an intriguing side effect, the backfilling of seawater from the Gulf actually enhanced the lake's silk content rather than the mine. The local ecosystem would likewise shift as a result. So, no one lost their lives in the incident, but it's pretty clear that something went wrong. It's hard to believe that it was just a coincidence, that the well-established mine was breached by the well-established drilling company Taxico. 
it seems that the drill on the rig got stuck between 1,200 and 1,300 feet deep, which is funny because it's the same depth where the mine failed. It's almost certain that the two events were connected. What's interesting is that the mine had been experiencing subsidence for at least 10 years before the inundation. The mine's instability was being closely monitored. So assuming that Texaco was drilling in the right spot, disaster could still have happened because even weakening an area around the mine is enough to cause a structural failure. It's kind of like when you try to dig a hole in the wet sand at the beach and it just crumbles around you. The big question though is how did this happen? How did Texaco and the Diamond Crystal Mining Company, both well-established and experienced companies, manage to allow this disaster to occur? It's a question that will likely be debated and studied for years to come. One thing is for sure though, the aftermath of the incident was devastating, with three dogs losing their lives and the environmental impact of the inundation was severe. Well, it seems like we finally have a little bit more clarity on what went wrong during the drilling incident, and even though the official report didn't provide a conclusive answer, it looks like Texaco might have made a pretty big blunder in their calculations. I mean, we've all made mistakes, but this one was a doozy. It seemed like they misread the charts which led them to dig into the salt dome instead of the designated area. And we all know what happened after that. The drill got stuck and the mine was breached, causing a huge inundation. Even though Texaco wasn't officially blamed, it's pretty obvious that they were the ones who messed up. That's probably why they had to pay out a whopping $32 million to the Diamond Crystal Mining Company, as well as $14 million to a botanical garden that was also affected. All in all, it was a pretty costly mistake. The Lake Peñur disaster was a terrifying and tragic event that could have easily resulted in the loss of life. It was a reminder of the power of nature and the potential dangers of human error. The incident also had significant financial implications for all parties involved, resulting in large payouts to the affected companies and individuals. But beyond the financial cost, the Lake Peñur disaster left a lasting impact on the community and the environment. The loss of the unique ecosystem in the lake and damage to nearby property is still felt to this day. It serves as a cautionary tale about the importance of responsible and careful practices in any industry, particularly those with potential environmental impact. Let us hope that we have learned from this tragedy and continue to work towards a more sustainable and safe future. And this brings us to the end of our video. We hope you found our videos informative and thought-provoking. If you haven't already, be sure to hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications so you never miss an update from us. And remember, disasters can happen to anyone, but by coming together and sharing knowledge, we can build a safer and more resilient future. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.